And welcome to episode 14 of the Luminosity of Free Software. It is a nice evening here in Zurich, finally feeling a bit like spring in the air as opposed to the endless, endless torrential rain and coldness we've had. So that's all rather nice. Um, tonight we have a couple of topics that we're going to be discussing and going over. The first of which is uh, looking at grassroots promo uh, promotion to the public uh, of free software and the other topic being something a little more fun uh, and that is the the open source game or free software game if you, um, for a lot of people anyways uh, which is West North. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about why I decided to slip that into what has generally been a pretty you know fairly serious topic show um, up until this point. Um, but before we get there and of course, at the end, we'll have the usual Q&A session. Uh, if you're in IRC, um, then you can ask questions there. If you're in the live uh, stream, you can ask questions there. I'll try and find them. I've also got a bunch of questions that people sent in by blog. Um, there were a few people that um, you got, we're following the earlier, if you're trying to catch us live and you're getting a please hold on, please wait by or stand by message, um, the Google Plus automated start of the Hangout from the event that I posted uh, created a non on-air Hangout, even though it was an on-air event. So I've got to stop trusting those automated systems. So, but you should be able to find it um, in the uh, on your invitations right now. Otherwise, you'll have to catch it later on YouTube with the rest of the crowd. Um, I'm just actually going to let people know, aha, there we are. People are finding the second video. I'm watching people figuring it out right now in IRC. So that's, that's good to see. Good. So on to the first topic of the evening, which is grassroots free software promo. And I think thought I'd talk about this because, uh, well, there's a, there's a number of reasons. Often what I talk about on, on the show is a result of things that I've read or seen or conversations I've had with people uh, in the last, you know, one or two weeks, sometimes the last month or so uh, online. And in this case, I've been observing a lot of, you know, people discussing, you know, whether or not free software um, has succeeded in, at certain things, um, whether or not it can, you know, succeed on the desktop. Right now, a lot of people are saying, well, it doesn't matter because tablets are going to take over and smartphones and everyone will use these devices. And so we don't have to worry about the fact that, you know, it, there's still a minority share of free software desktops out there. Uh, it'll solve itself. Uh, and then there was another kind of set of threads that I've, I watch, or I was following where people were kind of moaning and gnashing their teeth about uh, how Linux was being represented. And it was all, the, not just one area, it was all over the place. Uh, for instance, there was a very esoteric thing such as a uh, story on the BBC last week and there was someone running a Linux desktop um, that was actually the story. It was uh, controlling um, your home automation with gestures over a you know, Wi-Fi signal. And they were using Linux to coordinate this thing, and it was there. And apparently in the show, they talked about Microsoft Windows, or in the commentary, they talked about Windows several times, but never Linux. And so we were like, oh, you know, why is this? And it kind of occurred to me as I was thinking about this that there's been a real shift in I don't know how long, 10 years maybe. Um, it's, it's one of those very slow kind of things that I think is hard to notice happening while it's happening, kind of a boiling of the frog uh, sort of syndrome. Um, and the, sorry, someone just mentioned in the IRC channel that uh, there are two listed videos. Yes, the one that's working is the one that's working. The other one that's doing nothing is doing nothing. So switch to the one that's working. Uh, sorry. So the, um, this is one of those very slow progressions, I think. And I think back to when I first really started getting you know, involved with the free software community, one of the things I did was I went to my local Linux user group. And these things are pretty much non-existent now. Um, most places, 
that have them don't anymore. Some places do, but from what I've talked to people who are uh, familiar with these you know, last kind of remaining dinosaurs, they've really changed uh, focus um, and they're not nearly as vibrant as they once were. But that's where you know, it used to be. These days, uh, it's a little bit different. Um, and what people tend to do, and, and the Linux user group, right, that was there for people to come together, support each other, tell each other about you know, what was cool with free software. People would organize install fests, if you remember those, where you know, people would book a room and people could show up for, you know, on a given day and get Linux installed onto the computer. Um, Linux user groups used to, uh, the one I was involved in, we used to do this a few times a year, actually. So it was very grassroots. Um, but a few things happened. One, the audience uh, for you know, Linux in particular kind of shifted a bit in two directions, one more professional and one more mainstream. And so it wasn't as you know, the hobbyist geek didn't you know, um, occupy the center of, of the audience anymore. And the other thing that happened was online resources became very good. And so people wanting to figure out, oh, how do I do, you know, this, you know, X, Y, or Z, would actually go online and just find documentation online that was really, you know, comprehensive. And so this in-person, you know, sharing this oral passing of knowledge, um, it wasn't, it, it just became less and less necessary. And so while the in-person groups, local groups started to, you know, fade out, um, we did see more of the, say, the Ubuntu local groups pop up. Um, when I was living in Vancouver, that had pretty much replaced the lo lo local Linux user group. And it also had a very interesting bent in that it was basically about promoting uh, canonical products. Um, so that was kind of different as well. Um, and outside of that kind of mm, uh, stream of things that are happening, what we see is a lot of people rooting for and hoping that companies will be able to spread the word, get it out there, break through. Um, and so we know, for instance, we have Google with Android, which is a really great system for what it is and what it's intended to do. It's not Linux as we know it, as everyone knows, it has its own user space and there's a lot of issues with its relationship with hardware. Um, so <laughs> someone actually in the IRC said, I double dare you to type everything twice, sound effects and all. Um, do the two channels. This is going to go on all evening, isn't it? <laughs> Anyways, so we a lot of people are waiting for uh, you know you, people like Google to make the big breakthroughs. And when Google says, "Oh, we've got Chromebooks," I was like, "Yes, Chromebooks." When Dell says we are shipping with some uh, some systems with Ubuntu, like, "Okay, Dell, great." And when you know uh, Yola has Sailfish, like, "Okay, great, Sailfish." And a lot of the people in the community seem to be kind of taking a step back and just rooting for almost like a spectator sport, um, the companies that are involved. And it is true that companies tend to have more resources and as an individual entity can address a larger audience. And because they have resources, they can also do it day in, day out and really hammer away at a given message. There's a few problems, however. One is that uh, the message that gets spread is very much dependent on the company. There's not, it's not really a democratic process, not a representative process. There's not really, there's actually a lot of disincentives to uh, approach it from the ethical standpoint. Um, and while the ethical standpoint of free software is not the whole story, it is a significant part of it. Uh, and so it doesn't need to be all the promo. It can't be, it shouldn't be, but it tends to get completely missed because it doesn't really fit very well with a lot of business models. Uh, it's either irrelevant or even endangering to the, the way that some of these companies are set up. So they just kind of skip over that. Um, and again, a lot of these companies are in competition with each other. And so instead of getting a you know, harmonious, consistent, easy to understand um, message, we get a lot of competing messages. Worse yet, when the messages come out, they tend to be very focused, not so much on free software and Linux promotion, <clears throat> but on the promotion of the company themselves. Again, nothing wrong with that, but it doesn't really help free software as an entity, as an idea move forward. 
And in the worst case scenarios, when the companies stumble and fall, we've seen a number of these, you know, Sun, Novell, and the list goes on and on. If you want to go way back, we could include, you know, um, the people who did Nautilus, for instance. I mean, this easel, right? I mean, this has been going on for years. When they fall to the wayside, their message also disappears with them. And so there's no long-term continuity to messaging. So I, I was thinking about this, like, you know, a lot of what people are kind of worried about and, and you can almost hear that they're missing something, you know, like, ah, there's, there's something in this message I'm missing. And I think part of it is that human voice, the community voice. What are people in the community um, who might be working for a company that's doing free software or at a research institution, or they might be a hobbyist or an enthusiast. Um, but what is, where's is our voice as a global community outside of the boundaries of, of, um, of, of companies? And there really isn't a lot of infrastructure for that right now. So I started, you know, the beginning talking about rambling, if you will, about Linux user groups. And we don't really have a structure like that now. And I don't think we can just bring back Linux user groups. The reason why they disappeared, um, well, as I mentioned, better online resources, audience changed. I, I don't think they're relevant anymore. I don't think you could reanimate that exact sort of thing again. So that really, I think, poses an interesting question. Is there a new or a different uh, kind of structure that could be put forward that would once again give a significant, meaningful local voice to people who want to see free software succeed? Um, would there be a way to, you know, maybe not install fests or maybe install fests? Those are probably still also useful. Um, but those kind of gatherings where you, you know, spread the word. I often walk down the street and I see little kiosks dedicated to all kinds of crazy things. Um, you know, everything from massage oils and, and meditational things to religions and on the street. You see people standing out there behind little booths and talking to people about it. Uh, and I thought, you know, that'd be really cool to see with free software. I think what is really missing, though, is some coordination. Um, and I think that's what a lot of today's audience around free software really needs. And I think it's one of the reasons why they resonate as a group, or we, because I'm part of this, you know, this community as well. We as a group resonate really well with companies is that they tell us, hey, this is what we're doing. And so you don't have to come up with it from you know whole cloth yourself. With the Linux user groups, you know we had to organize speakers and events and everything we had to come up with ourselves. There was no boilerplate. Um, I think that's something that, for instance, the Ubuntu local groups did a little bit better. They provided some boilerplate, but I think it'd go a lot further than that. Um, the so a, a, another community that I think is interesting to learn from. Uh, although not wildly successful either in, in terms of taking over the world, but uh, is the uh, company that puts out AD&D, Ad, um, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. And when they came out with version four, they had a really interesting conundrum on their hands. A lot of people didn't like the changes um, to the rules that they had made. It was a completely new system. They had to introduce it to people and they realized that the primary audience, people who had played it before, were all, yeah, a lot of them already had kids now of their own. Um, they were adults with, with jobs and they were busy and they, they didn't have, they weren't, you know, university or high school students kicking around with, you know, three or four days just to sit around and, and play orcs and, and elves together. So what they did is they, they put together little packs of pre-made scenarios and games and they sent it out to game shops all over hither and yon and publish it on online. Say, so if you want to get together and play, you know, D&D with people, here you go. It takes, you know, two hours or an hour and a half down at your local shop. It's on this evening, go down there and you would go there and it was already pre-made. So nobody really had to put a lot of effort into it. Um, the people who were running the games would just open up the pack and hand out the cards and away you go. Uh, I thought it was a really interesting way of providing some useful boilerplate to re-engage with uh, your audience. And I, I think there's an opportunity there for something similar with free software when it comes to grassroots promo. The, that thing we've kind of lost, or more or less, I think, in the last while. Um, and that is having groups of people, or a group maybe, multiple would be fine too, who are able to put together little how-to-do-it packs. 
here's a pack, you know, either download it, probably digital would be the most sensible, but you know, things that would say, here's an idea, here's a, um, an event you could put on, here's the things you have to take care of, uh, here's the topics to do, you know, you could discuss, maybe here's some, you know, sample materials, etc. cetera. Um, I think that would go a long way. And the reason that I think this would be really important is despite all these companies putting all this effort into free software, and they're doing a remarkable job at what they're doing technology-wise, the idea of free software is still pretty much unknown in the public. Um, I continuously introduce people to the ideas of free software and the open source methodology. Um, and people are amazed. It's like, wow, I never, yeah, I didn't know this was, it was happening or it was, it was like that, or it's a really compelling set of ideas. And I also get the feeling that if we want to see free software not become a balkanized corporate affair, strictly, um, and we want it to become instead an open affair that involves corporations, uh, as well as community, as well as research, as well as government and education. I think we need to take a bit of a, um, of a position in the driver's seat and do a little more promo from the community out and not just stand aside and, and uh, play cheerleader for companies hoping that they will represent the message consistently and over time. So that's all I got to say about that, he says as he rants on. So uh, the second topic that I wanted to go on about tonight um, is Westnoth. So I'm sure most of you have, have played it at some point in time or another. Um, I think the actual official title is The Battle for Westnoth. And I'll just put um, up the URL down below there. And of course, clickable links in the YouTube down below later. So Westnoth, why Westnoth? Well, I looked over what I'd gone through in the first 13 episodes of Luminosity. And then I looked at my topic for tonight of, you know, grassroots promo free software. I thought, wow, you know, this, yeah, I've gotten a little serious at times, which is good. I mean, there's a lot of serious topics um, in free software from, I mean, it's running the world practically uh, from big data to supercomputers to smartphones and everything in between. Um, but kind of going in, in hand in hand with the theme of doing a little more grassroots stuff and not getting overly caught up or, or completely invested in the, the corporate angle. Uh, I think it's kind of nice to step back every once in a while, smell the roses and go, not everything is like super serious. Not everything is, you know, taking over the world and, you know, being the uh, technology for, you know, the next awesome gadget that will be produced by the millions and sold to unwitting consumers around the world. There's a human side to free software and humans don't just work, we also play. And so I thought, you know what, let's cover a game. And, and one of my favorite games, um, just given by the fact that I, I keep coming back to it, you know, when, I'm, when I sit back and go, oh, I'd like to play a game or something, I often come to West North. So what is West North really quick, in case you don't know, which I assume you all do. Um, it is a turn-based uh, strategy game where you have little characters, um, mages, and orcs and things, kind of goes in, in theme with the D&D thing I mentioned earlier, doesn't it? Uh, and you go out on quests and you have to fight your way through uh, plot lines or, or plot driven quests. And it, it's, it's really interesting because it was released initially in 2003, um, if I remember correctly. Let me just double check that on, uh, yes, in June 2003, which makes it a really good time to cover it because it's, well, June 2013. So 10 years ago, uh, Westnoth was released and it's still being developed to this day. They actually just released um, in end of May, uh, the development version 11.1.4, I believe it is. And it's got, they've got a new, they're working on a bunch of new um, interfaces to the add-ons client they have, which I'll get to in a second. Um, and, 
they're redoing the editor. So you, when you're editing campaigns, making that better. So that's you know really quite interesting. They've managed 10 years and they're still working on this exact same game. And this is interesting because the, the video game industry, right, tends to put out a title, they put out downloadable content for it for a few years, and then it kind of kind of get, kind of gets abandoned. Um, some of the online games sit in idle online, um, but there's very few games, even commercial games, that are able to say, "Yeah, we've been working on it for ten years and improving it and putting out new content and stuff." Just not that many outside of like the world of Warcraft of the world. So I think West North, in that sense, is really successful. Um, I, I took a look at the code base tonight just to because it's what I do. And it turns out there's a quarter of a million lines of code, 253,542 according to slow count. Um, it's mostly C++, uh, little bits of, and pieces of other things. So it's, it's a significant uh, application. And it was kind of interesting because I was looking through the source code and I thought, you know, this, this is actually a really good place uh, for people who are looking to you know, brush up on their coding skills or learn a bit more about such things. It's actually not the worst of projects to get involved with. A, it's fun uh, to work on a game. And B, they've got a lot of really neat stuff in there. And their uh, random name generator, for instance, is based on Markov chains, which isn't a remarkably complex concept by any means. But I think it's a really nice introduction to these kinds of ideas in a very friendly um, kind of fashion where you can go in and toy around with them. So their code base actually has a, a surprising number of neat little things in it. They also do things like, as I mentioned, their add-ons client, which I think is key to why it's maintained its, its um, popularity uh, for so many years. So what you can do, it doesn't come with just, you know, a hard baked in storyline. It is like many of the best games, uh, in my opinion anyways, it is a game engine and then it loads a storyline into it and you can load additional storylines. Um, and so people create these campaigns uh, as well as uh, tile sets and these things called eras which define kind of the rules of, of how the units work. So you can have a medieval era or an era of extra magic or whatever. Um, so there's all these different eras, these different icon or uh, unit packs and campaigns. And people spend lots of time working on them. It's fun, it's game stuff, it's art, it's writing. Um, some are better than others for sure. And then you can upload them to the official West North server. And then everybody who's got West North can then download them. They also have online play with servers that are online. So you just open up your West North, connect to the central server and you can play against other people. Uh, or you can quite easily from inside the game start a local um, server and play against people on, on your own network. So it's not a, you know, a local you know, one person in front of one computer, limited you know, replayability because it's just the one storyline. It's really open-ended. I think it's been absolutely key and, and, and central to its longevity. Besides that, it's also really fun to play. It's really well balanced. Um, it's one of the things about strategy games where you want to win, but you also want to kind of always feel like you're on the edge of losing. At least that's kind of what I, the games I like. So you have to kind of strive. Um, you know, and there are different difficulty levels, of course, that you can set. But it's really, when a really well balanced game, you know, is winnable, but you got to try. And you're always kind of right there, like thinking, oh, you know, this could go wrong. And it builds that tension like a really good story. And keeps you going and they managed to do that very well and i remember you know some years back there was a lot of effort in, in balancing uh the game so they in this current release they're working on besides new add-on stuff um new uh, add-ons client then a new editor to create content which really shows where the value is perceived they're also working on new ais um including new micro ais uh which seem to be uh, the ability to have these kind of purpose-driven um, uh, routines that run specific characters in the campaign. So you can have a coward, you can have a guy that tries to bottle, that in, when they're fighting tries to bottleneck, um, etc. So that's kind of neat. So it'd be more variety. Um, right now in a campaign, it tends to be fairly consistent in the gameplay when you're fighting against an enemy. So this might might change it up a bit. And it shows there's a lot of room for, you know, change, improvement, uh, and new things. So 
again, if you're if you uh, know C plus plus, or you're an artist, there's you know, or you like writing, uh, you know, fantasy campaigns. I'm surprised there isn't. I wonder if there is by now a um, uh, Game of Thrones themed campaign. If not, I bet you there will be eventually. Uh, you can get involved, and there's lots of great stuff to get in there and play with. Um, it's also great fun for the family. I found we've, with uh, <clears throat> our family here, we've had times when it's bad weather outside, sat around with all of our laptops in the in the in the, in the house and and uh, and played Westnoff. So it's really cool in that sense. Um, oops, wrong screen. I was about to thought ah I should bring it up and give a really quick show of what it looks like. Oops, it took over full screen. There we go. And I've got it starting on multiple machines now. Hold on. You'll probably hear the uh, the music. The music is also really nice, and that uh, really impressed me, has impressed me over the years as well, the quality of, of the included uh, art. So as soon as screen share lets me Do, do, do. Maybe eventually. It's not letting me share anything. Well, so, oh, there we go. So, as you can see, it's got this really kind of nice, it always reminds me of like Lord of the Rings when you open up the book and you see the map inside of it. Um, the add ons client, this is the not the development version, but the stable version here. Um, the add-ons client is actually improved quite a bit in the development version where you can um, filter not just by name but also by status, whether it's complete or not. Um, the sorting is done a bit differently. You can see you've got factions, campaigns, eras, um, etc. And there's quite a good number of them. So it's really kind of interesting. I, I think it's interesting they've got their own content delivery system um, as well. I think that's an area where there's there's definite opportunity for collaboration um, in the free software world. So, anyways, let's you've got the various campaigns. This is the first one. It's a novice level one. Again, you can choose a difficulty. Go in. And eventually it'll running a bit slow with uh, Hangouts on the same machine. So it's got an interesting story. As you can see, the artwork is pretty nice. And they actually refresh this regularly. And the um, Delphidor, the mage, over the years has actually refined into quite the character. Um, he's visually noticeable, you can always pick him out in the crowd, um, and he, they just keep filling in more and more bits about his, his story. So we'll just skip that really quick. And you've got this really nice turn-based strategy where you're supposed to, yeah, this is the, um, the demo, so you, or the, the um, tutorial basically. They tell you, you know, how to do things. And so you're supposed to click on your guy and move him over here and not overly exciting. But this gives you an idea of, of what the game looks like. I think it's really quite impressive um, given the fact that it is A, open source, and B, or free software, and it's been going for, for so long. Um, great. So I think it's about all I have to rumble on about West North at the, at the moment. And, and again, you know, the idea is that you know, free software is cool. It's not necessarily... Um, always serious and there's a lot of fun and enjoyment to be had out there and stuff that has nothing to do with markets and selling devices or market share etc another buzzword uh, bingo <laughs> um, entries so I thought it'd be kind of nice to spend a little bit of time on the shows just to kind of remind um, you know everyone including myself that yeah it's also about fun so without further ado we will switch quickly and smoothly into the QA session. 
So I'm just catching up with the IRC here. <clears throat> Someone asked, have I eaten my cats? Have I eaten my cats? I would never eat my cats. Why would I? Why would anybody ask that? No, no, my cats are, are, are all good. But yeah, they're not joining me today. The, the Colin was in earlier and he nosed his way in um, onto my desk and then decided, no, he didn't want to hang out here. So Sven Lundkamp uh, in IRC, he mentioned talking about the grassroots topic. He said, in his experience, some people tend to trust companies more than grassroots communities, at least here in Germany. I know some people who don't want to use Linux because they don't know who is behind it. And that's quite true. Um, companies provide a, uh, or in organizations in general, it doesn't have to be necessarily a company, it can be various, organization, various organizational structures, but it's quite true that having a uh, organization with a structure that you is well-defined, that you know can, is, is there. And the nice thing with the company is you can engage them economically, right? So you can purchase support um, or you can go, well, they're selling stuff to people. And so they're, they'll, they're incentivated to keep supporting it and, and listen to people as, as customers, not just as fellow community members. Uh, there is a difference between that, you know, democratic versus um, capitalist or economic is probably a better way of putting it, um, uh, standpoint. I think it needs both. Um, so as, you know, in doing grassroots campaigning and, and discussion, um, this is a great way to get the information out to people that there is also a lot of companies behind it. So I think it needs both. I don't think that companies do a really good job of selling the ideas of free software, why it's important, why it's, it's worth making a change in what you're doing, you know, moving from a proprietary operating system to a free software one, moving from a proprietary database solution to a free software one or whatever. Um, they don't do a tremendously great job of that. They do a reasonably decent job of it. Um, but when you look at where they've really done very well, it hasn't really been because it's all been one company and their message. Linux itself is a success because it's been, you know, thousands of companies and tens of thousands of individuals um, working it both from the company as well as the organizational, as well as the grassroots level. Um, and I think that's really the kind of the model that's needed more. Um, so we need both. We need grassroots and we also need companies. Um, so I, I'm, I hope I didn't come across as anti-capitalist or anything like that or anti-company. Um, I think we need both. I think they both provide things that the other don't. And so they complement each other really well. And yeah, as part of a grassroots um, you know, promotion and campaign, it, the idea of, of corporate support and the relationship between companies and the technology um, definitely would be a part of it. <laughs> As one person said, uh, JD Rab says, uh, basically you need someone to slap in the face your software does not work. That's a really interesting myth because most companies, when their software doesn't work and you go to slap them in the face, they don't really care. So, yeah. Okay, so um, other, talk, other questions. Um, someone just asked about uh, phones in the IRC channel and that's actually on the list. That's coming up in just a couple minutes. So if you just hang on there, see we? Sivi, not sure how you pronounce your, uh, your nick there. So Andrew Lake asked actually at the last week, it was right after the la um, uh, he watched the, sh the last episode. He says, if I want to build a KDE application to work with Frameworks 5, which widget framework should I be targeting? QWidget, Qt QML, Qt QML components, and what is their current state in Qt 5? So, okay, jargon, 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 right? Uh, Frameworks 5 are the next release of KDE's libraries that the KDE community is working on right now. It, they use Qt 5, uh, which is the most recent version of the Qt library, which is used by all kinds of groups, not just KDE, but also by Yola, Blackberry, um, Google for products like Google Earth, Skype, uh, Maya 3D, um, uh, Mathematica, etc. So uh, he asked if you want to be building an application that would be relevant to KDE and really targeting the next version, so for, you know 5.x, 
Should you be using QWidget or QML? And, and QWidget is the old style of doing things, and nothing wrong with old. It works. It works really well. Um, and these are the traditional desktop apps that we all kind of you know and love and or hate, depending uh, on the desktop, with menus and buttons and. QML was originally designed to bring some fluid animated uh, UIs that would be able to be done more for touch devices, not strictly for desktop. And over time, it's really kind of evolved into something that probably will in many years, not soon, but end up replacing um, the Q widget tools uh, for, for new development anyways. So what would I recommend? So with Qt 5.1, there are the desktop components. And this gives you the ability to use QML, but have all the desktop app uh, widgets, and they're styled using the native uh, style. So they'll look exactly like any other desktop application, Mac, Windows, um, Linux as well. KDE will look like a KDE application. Um, so it, with Qt 5.1, it no longer becomes as binary choice. There are some things that QWidget is still better at and, and, and good for. Um, I find it way easier to develop UIs in QML, however. It's a lot faster. The turnaround cycle is quicker. You can get pixel perfect uh, representations of things that don't include only widgets, and you just spend a lot less time uh, <clears throat> mucking around in C++ uh, to get your UI there on the screen. And with, you know, the modern expectations for applications of things being beautiful and animated and fluid, it's really hard to achieve that. I mean, we've been, you know, we've spent years doing that with, um, with Plasma um, and kind of really hit a lot of ceilings there with, you know, just doing it in C++ um, with declarative programming styles. And QML's approach, which is just a, from the ground up, a different approach of doing it. It's um, declarative instead of imperative, and it, yeah, just very tuned towards uh, making dynamic uh, user interfaces. Um, just, you can just go much, much, you can actually get to and, and go beyond the current modern expectations for applications. And then your UI also has the opportunity to bridge very naturally and fluidly um, over to touch devices, um, TVs if you want to do TV stuff, etc. So you're not only designing something that will only work on desktops. So I definitely recommend if you're targeting Qt 5, get on Qt 5.1, um, which will be out very soon, and start using uh, the QML desktop components. They're really good performance, um, and yeah, in my opinion, kind of the way to go. Um, if you have to use existing older libraries, and this is where it kind of gets more difficult, if you're going to be using a lot of UI components from existing libraries, so you're going to be using, you know, actual widgets from these libraries. If you're going to be using dialogues and windows from them that aren't, you know, inside your own application, then it's, it's not such a big deal. Um, but if you're going to be using, you know, maybe graphing widgets or something that's written with QWidget, then you're kind of stuck and you're going to have to use QWidget for at least some part of your application. Otherwise, you can use QML. And what we will see, because it's already started with uh, the Plasma components and some of the other work in the KD libraries we've been doing to bring more and more of the uh, UI functionality that we've been offering uh, with, Q with QWidget in the past to QML. So that's my recommendation there, QML. And so then I have a veritable tome of questions from Tiho. Um, and this is actually where we'll get to the phone questions. So Tio says he's, he's curious about the packaging of Plasma Workspaces 2 by default. He asks, or she asks, I'm not sure which, uh, <clears throat> will the desktop, netbook, and possibly tablet and other shells be shipped in the same package as Plasma itself, or can these be easily packaged separately? Um, really good question. So with Plasma Workspaces 2, one of the things that we're really working um, towards, um, and already have got the, the start of it here uh, working, is the ability to have uh, all of our different UI 
uh, presentations. So we have one now for desktop, one for netbook, one for media center, one for active, and they're a little bit separate. They all use the same underlying framework and they share the vast majority of their code, but they still implement a custom shell for each one. And we're getting rid of that, which allows us to do some really cool things like switch at runtime fluidly between the different UIs without having to restart any application at all. Uh, so he's w wondering if these will be all shipped with Plasma itself or packaged separately. Um, so what we plan on doing is making them all available from the same place. You can easily get them, but we will, I mean, th this is one of the reasons why we're doing this is so on a device that really has no business doing any, say, desktop -y work, they can just ship, say, the tablet interface or a future phone interface um, for, for Plasma. Um, so it won't be all welded together and you won't have to pick, you know, oh, I'm going to take everything and, and the kitchen sink. The good news is that the packages for each tend to be pretty small. Um, it's really all of this support infrastructure that's big. And when you look at the actual shells, def shell definitions themselves, they're pretty small. So you will be able to get desktop, netbook, uh, tablet, et cetera, separately. Um, but you can also get them easily all at once. Um, we're really trying to do or give, you know, best of both worlds in that sense, where you can choose, but you don't have to go far to choose. Uh, he then goes on to say, if I have understood correctly, these shells or whatever they're called, yep, shell, are completely written in QML. So will it be possible to install them from KD? Look, yes, it will be uh, possible to install them, to create your own, even share them with other people, um, and we will be able to, uh, you know, be able to upload them um, online, have other people browse them and grab them. Uh, we kind of hope that this will result in a bit of an explosion of different um, approaches, different UI layouts. So instead of having to you know, spend a lot of time configuring it so it looks like that screenshot you saw online <laughs> that you saw and you know, someone post and go, I wish I had that. They can actually create a shell package, share it, and, and other people could get that exact same look and feel really, really easily. It is truly one of the benefits of QML. So a lot of the bits where it has to talk to the operating system are in C++ still, but those tend to be stock components that we ship with the core um, runtime. So except for some, you know, there will be exceptions to this, but generally virtually all shells will be QML only, won't have to have extra C++ support shipped with them, which means they will be runnable between systems quite easily. Uh, he then asked, is it intended that there's only one plasmoid for all shells with small changes for each shell if necessary? For example, will we be using the same plasmoids on tablet and desktop? The answer is yes. Um, it already happens. So we already on Plasma Active and Plasma Desktop, we actually do use the same uh, plasmoids for things like networking and battery and a lot of components are the same. Some are a little bit different, um, but most of them are exact same. The way that Plasma works is that in your Plasmoid, you can say, when I'm running in, in a touch environment, it should look a little more like this. And when I'm running in desktop where I have keyboard and mouse, it's got to look a bit more like that. And so you have the one Plasmoid package and it can adapt. We try and write user interfaces that don't need to adapt a lot. We found there's for most things, not everything, but for many things anyways, you can have one UI that travels across form factors very nicely. You have to design it a little bit differently and you have to design it with this in mind, but it's possible. Um, there are just some things you can't get around. For instance, when you're using a mouse and keyboard, you don't want buttons that are gigantically huge and massive. Whereas on touch, you really do want this. And so with the multi uh, form factor support that's built right into the plasma design. Uh, individual plasmoids can say, oh, I'm running on touch. Great. Please make this button and all my buttons really freaking huge. Um, and, and, you know, at least compared to what you'd have in a mouse and keyboard uh, environment. Um, so yes, will you be using the same plasmoids in tablet and desktop? You already are if you're using um, uh, plasma active and plasma desktop. Um, and, and someone actually asked a follow-up question on this online. How hard is it to adapt a currently existing desktop app to support different screen sizes? That's another thing that we do. Um, we really discourage 
pixel based layout where you go, this is 15 pixels, that's 18 pixels, that's 148, this is 18 grid units. Um, this starts to build in a lot of assumptions about yeah, screen geometry and size. Instead, what we try and do, and we're designing UIs these days, is we look at it in terms of proportion. So we say, you know, we have a screen, we want to present this kind of, of, of data um, and information. How can we present it in a way that if you have it on a big screen, it scales up nicely. If you have it on a small screen, it scales down nicely. Um, and so we scale up and down the interface. And so we try and make fluid proportional uh, UIs as opposed to pixel-based or grid-based um, UIs. Uh, one example is the, uh, the Plasma um, Active Add-ons application, which if you run it on like a phone style device, you have one nice little uh, column at a time and you can sweep, swipe back and forth. On tablet, you have this really nice uh, panel-based drill down interface and on desktop it just looks yeah you have the same kind of interface but you have so much space you don't really notice this it just looks like a you know almost like a like midnight commander kind of file manager thing rears one panel after the other um, for existing desktop applications it depends on how they're written so with their QWidget stuff we also do no hard-coded uh, pixel sizes in theory anyways um, there's a bunch of work in 4.11 uh, to make things work on really high resolution, you know, the retina display uh, type resolutions. Um, and so the work uh, being done there, uh, this, yeah, allows, you know, got rid of some of the last little bits of assumptions about screen size we had in some of our apps. So generally, you know, they scale pretty well. One of the problems that we have in traditional Q widget apps uh, based apps is they tend to assume you're running it at least on something somewhat modern, 800 by 600, often a little bit bigger than that. Um, and so some of these traditional desktop apps need a lot more work. But a lot of the more modern apps that we're doing now scale up and down quite nicely. And it's really about thinking about it in terms of I'm not writing with a set screen size in mind. Instead, I'm writing it from the idea of if I have a certain amount of space, how do I fill it? Uh, then Tiho went on to ask, because he had just a million questions, which is great, um, in terms of the look and feel package. So we're shipping with Plasma Workspaces 2 a package that has um, the look and feel for uh, the login manager, the splash screen, the logout user interface, the lock screen, all these things. Um, in fact, we just started working with a actual uh, graphic and UI design firm uh, in the US on coming up with some concepts for the defaults for this. I'm really excited about that. We'll see how the, the quality um, ends up being as a result. Um, so he asks, in the look and feel package, can it carry support for multiple shells? And is it intended to be used this way? So uh, everything in there uses the Plasma package format, which except for the login manager, which is the only bit that doesn't use uh, Plasma Package directly right now anyways to access it. Except for the login manager, everything has that exact same um, support for adapting to the form factor. We try to discourage people from welding things tightly together going, well, if I'm running on this very specific shell package, then do that. Instead, we try and get people to think in terms of uh, input devices, um, you know, I may touch screen or keyboard and mouse, form factor, how big is my screen, um, what's my pixel density, these kinds of things. Um, but yes, the look and feel packages can, the contents of it can adapt to different uh, form factors. And he also went on to ask about the SVG theming. Could one package also carry support for different shells? Uh, he says, it's a bit annoying there's a different air theme for, des for desktop and netbooks. Uh, we completely agree. Um, one of the things that we'll get to, not quite yet, yet, we haven't got there yet, but we'll get to eventually, is harmonizing the SVG theming a bit more so we don't have so much variance between shells. Uh, he, then he goes on to say that Plasma ships with multiple themes, but only one, but only one seems to be actually improved. Would it make sense to ship only with one SVG theme, and then everything else could be installed on KDE Look or elsewhere? Um, and yeah, I mean, that's something that's occurred to me, and for the exact same reasons. Uh, I would like to ship with one uh, default shell package for each form factor that we target, 
and one SVG theme and have everything else uh, online that you can then grab. Um, with, and this do a few things. One, the base uh, install will be smaller and much more focused. Uh, and it will resolve this issue of having, you know, tying the updates to SVG themes and whatnot to that, you know, six month, whatever release cycle we end up doing with Plasma Workspaces too. So yeah, absolutely. And then this is a question that goes with the question that was asked earlier uh, in IRC. <clears throat> what do I think about the next generation of Linux mobile OSs like Mozilla's Firefox OS, Yolo Sailfish, Conical's Ubuntu Touch, Samsung's Intel Tizen? How about KDE on phones? And of the people using QML, which includes Yola and um, ourselves and Conical and Blackberry, which isn't there, uh, has there been collaboration defining QML APIs? So there hasn't been a lot of progress on QML API standardization. In Plasma Workspaces 4.11, we are shipping support for, or we have included the units uh, grid-based system that is in Ubuntu Touch. So if you're running an Ubuntu Touch or an application that you're wanting to run on Ubuntu Touch and a Plasma desktop, and you see that units dot, you know, uh, GR and whatnot that Ubuntu is, is providing is the way to do it there. This will also work in 4.11 and beyond um, in Plasma Workspaces. So we've been doing some work there. Um, we've been working with BlackBerry on standardizing packaging approaches. Um, how do you do the overrides, you know, for different form factors, as I was talking about earlier. So we've been working with them on that. We've got some code in Qt for that now. There's still a lot more work to be done and it's a little slow. Right now, everyone seems to be working on their kind of first revision in the, of their products in the case of Yola and Canonical. Um, we're working on our first hardware devices, uh, as is Yola. So everyone's like a little bit heads down and, and working hard on things at the moment. TZen is its own little world. Um, and, and not really involved with that. So what do I think about all these next gen OSs? Uh, I think most of them will fail and that's fine. Uh, that's how it works. You put a lot of experiments up there. We don't have to bet everything on one succeeding. Most of them will fail or a few of them will fail anyways. Some will succeed and it's really hard to tell right now which ones will succeed. Um, I'm not overly optimistic about Tizen. Intel seems to put out a new uh, mobile UI every few years. They tie really tightly with one big partner. It, I think it fits their, their culture, the way that Intel thinks. But this leads to orphaned things like Mego, right? And, and before that, Moblin. Um, TZen is very Samsung-y and that really limits its potential in, in adoption just as being overly tight with Nokia, limited interest in Mego. Uh, so yeah, I'm a little hesitant about, about the future of Tizen. Mozilla Firefox, um, really cool. They got um, a partnership going with Foxconn recently. Uh, I, I'm not big on HTML5-based platforms. It is less efficient than native app development. Native app development is not that difficult. Uh, the um, deployments benefits of HTML disappear on mobile, so there's no real point there. Um, I think it's interesting they've gone for like, you know, the low end phone. I think that's great they have a focus there. So, um, but yeah, yeah, not sure how that'll go. The rest, it, future will, will tell. And the question is how about KD on phones? And I think absolutely. Um, we're focusing right now on tablets and we'll be doing some set top boxy things this year as well. Uh, Eventually, I think we'll get to phones. Phones are so hard to break into. It's where there's a lot of competition, a lot of, of um, high power corporate focus. And it's really hard to get in because of carriers, cell phone uh, carriers and networks in the US, but also retail carriers in, elsewhere in the world. Um, it's a really, really hard market to break into. It's also very crowded, even the third party market, right? You have Android and iOS, number one, number two. And then you've got Windows and Blackberry and Mozilla and Yola and Canonical is trying to get in there and it's it's really crowded. Um, it's a huge market, but difficult to get into. The other side of it is that doing um, smaller run phone devices that are pretty cool and, and compelling to use, uh, it's not as easy to get 
your hands on these right now and trying to get ones that are actually free software compatible, even more difficult. It'll happen eventually though. So it's not our immediate focus, but we will inevitably get there. Um, and so we'll actually have the complete spectrum. I mean, we've, we, what, a year and a half ago, oh, maybe two years ago now, we did our first demo of Plasma actually running on a handset making phone calls. Um, so it's completely possible. And again, with Plasma Workspaces too, if there's a group of people that would like to actually get in there and start crafting a UI for uh, the phone handset form factor, this would be absolutely fantastic. So um, I think I will wrap it up there. As I just saw it, a Alexia Menard, Dark Tears joined the IRC channel. Crazy. Haven't seen that guy forever. My my French friend who lives in Brazil now. So shout out to you having just joined the IRC channel right when I'm wrapping up, but so be it. Uh, thanks everyone for coming out. Um, next week we'll get back to more serious non-game topics uh, again. And thanks for the questions. Again, if you have uh, a question I didn't cover tonight or something that pops up right afterwards, feel free to send it to me by email um, or on my blog, etc. So have a great night. Uh, keep the lights on in the land of free software.